Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Lerung, and it is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce our next speaker, Mr. Bruce Stokes. Mr. Bruce Stokes is the Director of Global Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research Center, a nonpartisan think tank based in Washington, D.C., where he assesses public views about economic conditions, foreign policies, and values. Two of his most recent and interesting studies at the Pew Research Center include the impact of Donald Trump's presidency on how the world views the United States and European attitudes towards the European Union post-Brexit. He is also a non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund and an associate fellow at Chatham House. Mr. Stokes is the co-author of the book, America Against the World, How We Are Different and Why We Are Disliked. He is a graduate of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and Johns Hopkins University School for International Studies. On a more personal note, he is the husband of Ambassador Wendy Sherman and the father of Ms. Sarah Sherman Stokes, two of our speakers at this year's Albright Institute. And as a student of US foreign policy who is constantly trying to make a sense of America's world in today's evolving global order, I can think of no one better than Mr. Stokes to provide this critical topic. And with that, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bruce Stokes to the Albright Institute. Thank, thank you so much. And it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And uh, I look forward to uh, our conversation uh, because uh, nothing's more boring than listening to somebody talk for an hour. So uh, we want to make this as interesting as, as possible. Uh, I'm going to be uh, throwing up on the screen uh, a lot of numbers. Um, I would say um, if, if for points of clarification, interrupt me, right? If you say, but how can that be? That, just, that number doesn't it, raise your hand and, we'll, and we'll, we'll stop and talk about that. And then we'll have a lot of time at the end to get into more uh, uh, detailed or more um, uh, in-depth conversation. But uh, uh, again, I look, I, what I like to do these things because I learn from you. I learn the questions you ask, the uh, observations you have, help us both think about what we should ask next in our surveys, but also, frankly, sometimes people have an interesting idea about how to interpret a piece of data that we hadn't thought of. So this is uh, very useful to me as well. Let me briefly talk about uh, what the Pew Research Center is um, and uh, uh, what we do, how we do our work. Uh, and then I'll share with you uh, the data we have on attitudes towards the United States, the US president, and uh, conclude with uh, some data to, to raise the question about does it matter? Because I think that's a, you know, that's an intellectually honest question we have to ask ourselves. Um, the um, uh, Pew Research Center is based in Washington. Uh, we've been around since 1996. Uh, we uh, started out only doing public opinion research. We now do a lot of big data research. In fact, you may have seen a piece in the New York Times actually uh, today, I think, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, where we just published a big data study on uh, when are women having babies in the United States and how that has changed over time. Um, and um, we uh, work on a variety of different topics um, from Amer just straight American public uh, uh, political opinion uh, to uh, work on religious faith and practices around the world. We do more surveys on that than anybody else in the world. Um, we do uh, a lot on the internet and use of the internet and information technology. Um, and we do more survey work on Hispanics in America than anybody else, and also big data work on Hispanics in America. So the thing I'd like to recommend, especially to college audiences, is uh, go to our website. It's free, but more importantly, it's searchable. <laughs> um, and I can promise you that if you're writing a paper and you need a piece of data, uh, you're likely to find a piece of data on that website uh, that your professor doesn't know. <laughs> so you'll look really smart. Um, uh, because you can ask this, this uh, website questions like, you know, has anybody ever asked Kenyans what they think about gay marriage? Well, actually, we have. So there's data there. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of data from all over the world uh, that might be of, uh, of interest and, and useful in your work. Uh, what I'm going to share with you today is the results of our annual survey 
of public opinion around the world in about 40 countries. This uh, year it was 37. Um, it is based on both face-to-face -face and telephone uh, surveys. We survey by telephone in the United States, in Japan, in Western Europe, but for most parts of the world, surveys are still done face to face, uh, which is why it takes anywhere from four to six weeks sometimes to do these uh, surveys. They're done uh, in 68 different languages. Um, and they're done all over the country. In other words, we don't just survey in the cities. We survey all over India, for example. Um, so it, it's pretty time consuming and very expensive, by the way. Uh, margin of error is three to five percent, which is kind of normal for these things. Um, these are the countries that uh, we surveyed this last year, uh, it's the most recent data. We're, we're surveying roughly in the same countries again uh, in 2018. Uh, that survey data won't be available for months, though we aren't even in the field yet. We're still trying to decide what questions to ask. So again, if you have some good ideas, let us know. We uh, ask every year about confidence in the U.S. Uh, uh, faith. Uh, do you have a favorable view of the U.S. and do you have confidence in the U.S. Uh, leader? Uh, this is one of maybe 40 questions we ask, two of 40 questions we ask in telephone countries and in face. Well, the interesting thing is that in many ways, face-to-face -face countries are more fun because you can ask about 50% more questions. People will sit still for a face-to-face -face interview longer than they'll sit still for a telephone interview. So um, uh, it's just one uh, thing. So we actually, in places like India or Brazil, you, you actually can ask far more questions, which is great fun. In the U US or in Europe, you're limited. And, but we have, every year since we started this uh, uh, survey, ask about favorability of the U.S. and other countries and confidence in the U.S. president and the confidence in, in other world leaders. Um, what was interesting is that the first survey we did in 2002, we were the first survey to find that there was rising anti-Americanism in the world in the Bush administration. And this, bear in mind, this was before the Iraq invasion. Um, just as a piece of advice, uh, in terms of don't be too quick to dismiss stuff you don't fully understand. When we did this survey in 2002, um, we weren't looking for anti-Americanism. The survey, I helped design the survey and the, the survey was supposed to be about globalization, this new phenomenon of, the, of this century and wouldn't, what do people think of it? Uh, in fact, I was in, at the UN asking the head of the UN Development Program, who's a friend of mine, like, you know, we're going to spend $4 million in this survey. Do we have the right topic? And he looked at me and said, oh, yeah, you're, it's a great topic. This is, the, this is the topic of the 21st century. That was September the 10th, 2001. On September 11th, obviously, the world changed. <laughs> And when we went into the field, we found stuff we didn't expect to find, right? We weren't looking for. And one of these things was anti, rising anti-Americanism. Uh, and we decided, you know, we better warn the White House. So we um, uh, went to see Condi Rice, who was then the National Security Advisor, uh, and Carl Rove, who was the President's Chief Political Advisor. And they dismissed it out of hand. Oh, this can't be true. We just know it's not true. People love us. Okay, you know. Uh, but we did that before we released the data. So the morning of the release, we had breakfast with a bunch of reporters. There's this breakfast uh, that happens almost every day in Washington. It's gone on for 50 years. We said, you know, we're going to give you a heads up. We're going to release this data. What we didn't know was that the people who went to that breakfast were White House reporters. Because it's the only time reporters can get out of the White House is if for breakfast, because other, you're, you're trapped in that building for the rest of the day. So they trotted back to the White House for the 9.30 briefing, which is the first briefing in the White House. 
They raised, you know, there's a report coming out a couple hours that there's rising anti-Americanism in the United States, uh, around the world. We have anything to say about this. And a guy named Ari Fleischer, who was then the president's press secretary, made the mistake that if you're ever in that position, don't ever make. <laughs> what he should have said was, I don't know what you're talking about, because it turned out that Condi Rice and Karl Rove never warned him, because they were so dismissive of the data. So he said, well, rather than saying, I don't, I don't know, oh, let me go find out. He said, well, this can't be true. We just know it's not true. It must be a Democratic poll. You know, it's just, it's. <laughs> so a couple hours later, we had the release of our survey. And we were like hoping maybe we'll get a television camera to come and cover this. There were 13 television cameras there <laughs> because the White House had attacked us without knowing what they were attacking. So just as a piece of, we're way off subject here, but just a piece, don't ever dismiss stuff out of hand <laughs> until you know what you're talking about because you may create the problem that you're trying to avoid. So we have been doing this survey uh, for, uh, since 2002. And attitudes towards the U.S. and attitudes towards the U.S. president go up and down, uh, as you might imagine. Um, this is what's happened in the last year in terms of confidence in the U.S. president. The global median at the end of the Obama administration was 64% of people in 40 countries um, uh, thought that they had, they had confidence in the international leadership of the U.S. president. Uh, in 2017, only 22%, a median of only 22%, had confidence in uh, the new U.S. president. Uh, and as you can see, the favorability of the U.S. went from six, a median of 64% to a uh, favorability of only 49%. So um, uh, both of these declined. Um, we can't... Uh, just because there's a correlation between two things doesn't mean there's a causation. We don't know whether the favorability of the U.S. went down and thus the confidence in the U.S. president went down or confidence in the U.S. president went down and then favorability of the U.S. went down. There's a lot of suggestion in the data it's the confidence of the U.S. president is the one that's the, the strongest. And I can tell you, having done other polls for the German Marshall Fund, we found the same thing, that these things tend to track each other. Uh, as you can see, here is the trend in our survey data uh, in um, Japan, for example, where uh, you saw a decline in support for both the uh, United States and for the U.S. president in Japan. Then it shot up with a little bit of a lag here, but it shot up when Obama was elected kind of trended a little bit downward, kind of ended on a, a high note, and then fell dramatically with the election of the new president. And the confidence at, and the favorability of the US went down as well. The same parallelism in India, uh, where um, there was kind of a norm here. Roughly half of Indians liked the US president, liked the United States. Bounced up a bit here. It's one of the other things you should, um, when you look at survey data, try to find out when the survey was taken. This survey, I mean, surveys are taken at a particular moment in time, and you should know what's going on around that moment in time because it might have affected the uh, results. Obama went to visit India. It was highly covered in the Indian press, very successful trip. We happen to be in the field right after that. Favorability of the president and, 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 and of the US went up. But then it went down. Now, did he do something wrong between this and this? Or did they just re, re, you know, kind of revert to the norm? It looks like it kind of reverted to the norm. But then it went down again once uh, Trump was elected. We see this again and again. For example, in our data, as you may know, the U.S. is often called upon, and we volunteer, to help people who have natural disasters. So in Japan, after the tsunami, we were the one who rushed in most of the aid. 
similarly in Indonesia after uh, 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 a, a tsunami, in uh, uh, other countries where there's been big natural disasters. It's the U.S. that has the wherewithal to actually come and help people in those moments. And I can tell you time and time again, Pakistan, big earthquake, whatever, the next year you see this uptick in favorability of the U.S. And then the next year it goes back down to wherever it was before. So as you think about things like that, like foreign aid, you can rent goodwill, but you can't buy it. And so you should not anticipate that if we do something good for the world, that it forever improves our image in the world. In fact, it tends to buoy it for a while, and then uh, things revert to some norm. Uh, even in Russia, the parallelism between the favorability of the US and confidence in the US president uh, tends to hold. Uh, favorable view of the U.S. is generally higher uh, in Russia than confidence in the U.S. president. Um, but as you can see, it went up. It, it, Russians were somewhat you know, favorably disposed towards Obama at the beginning, kind of dropped off dramatically. And then with the election of Donald Trump, 53% of Russians have, a, have confidence in the U.S. president, highest confidence level in our, the history of our survey, uh, and favorability of the U.S. went up as well. Um, uh, by the way, Russia, I'll show you in a minute, Russia, the confidence in the U.S., uh, favorability of the U.S. went up more in Russia than in any other country <laughs> after the election of, of Donald Trump. Um, the general takeaway from um, uh, the overall survey about the U.S. image is that our, our image is in decline uh, in the last year. Um, and uh, you may have noticed that Gallup released a survey two days ago uh, that found the exact same thing. No, broader number of countries, survey taken over a far longer period of time, but um, uh, found more or less the same results, different questions. Uh, in fact, this is a good point to stop and, and um, encourage you, if you're working with public opinion data, not if you just read in the newspaper maybe, but if certainly if you're working with public opinion data, you should look very closely at the methodology. Now, I'm not a methodologist. Uh, I'm a former journalist. I was a journalist for most of my life and a think tanker. But methodology is enormously important in trying to understand the importance of survey uh, results. Uh, first off, find out how they took the survey. Was it face-to-face? -face? Was it by telephone? Do they even tell you how they did the, did the survey? If they didn't tell, they don't tell, if you can't find, you know, you try and you can't find their methodology, be very wary. <laughs> uh, good uh, uh, surveys share with you the methodology. Uh, in the United States, find out if people actually use call cell phones. Uh, most of our phone calls are now by cell phone. Our interview are done by cell phone. That's because most Americans only have a cell phone. Um, uh, yet there are still surveys that only call landlines. And to give you an example of what the consequence of that can be, uh, there's a polling firm, you know, it's a reputable polling firm, Rasmussen. Uh, it's a Republican firm. It's a firm that the president always points to as he, he gets his highest numbers in the Rasmussen survey. Um, in 2012, when uh, uh, Romney was running against Obama, Rasmussen was the only survey that consistently showed Romney winning. It came out later that Rasmussen was only calling landlines. So I'm sure that the people they called voted for Romney. I don't doubt that that's what they heard, but who doesn't have a landline in the United States? Young people, minorities, poor people. Who voted for Obama in 2012? Young people, minorities, and poor people. 
So um, how you conduct the survey affects the results because it, it, it'll determine who you're actually talking to. Um, also, again, if you're working with survey data, um, you want to see the question. You want to not find, see the result, just the result. You want to find the, you want to look at the question yourself, eyeball the question, and decide for yourself whether it's a fair question. Writing a fair question is really difficult. Uh, you want it to be balanced. You know, if you say, if you write a question, uh, how much do you love the European Union? Well, that kind of puts your thumb on the scale, right? <laughs> um, you want to see whether there are loaded words in the question, you know, that could set off, um, you know, an emotion one way or the other in the respondent's uh, mind. And you should also realize that as hard it is, as people work to write a good question, it may not work out well. I would tell you every year we spend weeks and weeks writing our questions. I thought when I first started at the Pew Research Center, oh, you'd sit down for a couple hours in the afternoon and write out a questionnaire. This would be easy. I mean, writing a questionnaire is, you know, it's pretty easy. It's not. It's really hard. <laughs> and you go back and you go back and you talk about it and you think about it and you try to figure out. And I can tell you almost every year you get results back and you say, why in the world did we ask this question this way? What were we thinking? So again, you want, to, you want to look at the question and say, OK, do I think this is a reasonable question to ask people? And by reasonable, I mean not only is it fair and balanced, but does it, does it require more information from the respondent than it's reasonable to assume the respondent might have? You know, when I was a journalist, I wanted questions that were really technical and really, you know, kind of got down into the nitty gritties of politics. Those are horrible questions. <laughs> The average person doesn't really doesn't know what you're talking about. But the reality is people don't want to appear dumb. And you can often get people to give you a response even though they've never thought of that in their lives. So I am totally flipped on this. I firmly believe that the best questions evoke an emotional response, not a reasoned response. Now, I dare say the fact that you're sitting here and you're honored scholars of the Albright Institute, you aren't normal. <laughs> you are overly rational people. Get over it. <laughs> Most of the world does not operate on reason, and people like you and I tend to look down on those people. Stop it. The reality is most people operate on emotion, and that's OK. You go into the marketplace and buy a car because you like the way it looks. You know, Henry Ford refused to sell cars initially except black cars. All cars were black. And his rationale was, it's the same car under the hood. Why would I spend money painting it blue or red? Until his competitors started to sell more cars than he did. The reality is we all make decisions based on emotion, not reason. And uh, if you're trying to understand where people are coming from, in many cases, I think most cases, um, the best questions are ones that evoke emotion. You know, that everybody would have an emotion about this. They might not know. I mean, what I tend to say to people is, if you expect a lot of knowledge from the public, you're going to have your heart broken. We did a survey at the time. I don't know if you remember. Maybe you're too young at the time. But you know, Obama at one point when dealing with Syria said there's a red line in the sand. And if the Syrians cross this line, you know, it's going to be war. And then he didn't do anything. They crossed the line. He didn't do anything. They got a lot of criticism for that. <clears throat> but our survey showed that he did exactly what the people wanted. The American public did not want us to get into another war in the Middle East. He never got credit for that. But what was more interesting in our survey is that only 20% of the public could find Syria on a map. It didn't matter that they didn't know where Syria was. 
they knew, what they knew is they didn't want to get into another war. And that was the takeaway I took from that survey was, you know, rather than looking down on, well, what's their opinion about this red line and war which is irrelevant, they can't even find Syria on a map. What was irrelevant is they couldn't find Syria on a map. What was important was that they, that they, they knew they didn't want to send their sons and daughters into another war in the Middle East. So again, look and see, is this an emotional question or is this a question that's expecting too much knowledge from the respondent? Because if you expect too much knowledge, you might get answers, but you might not, they, they might not be trustworthy because the people have never thought about this. Um, and especially when you're surveying in the third world, you know, in India and in Africa, Latin America, where, where you're surveying all, you're surveying people with no education, right? Very poor people in rural areas. I was just last month in Rajasthan, which is rural India and northern India. And I was in a village and I was talking to, you know, nine guys sitting around in a circle. It was interesting. The guys wouldn't let the women in the circle. I had to talk to the women separately. Um, so I said to them, a uh, question we'd ask people in India, you know, do you, do you know who, you ever heard of this guy, Donald Trump? Only four of the nine people had ever heard of Donald Trump, even though they all had cell phones. And one of the four said, isn't he the guy who has three wives? <laughs> I didn't want to break his heart and tell him, yep, he had three wives and he didn't have three wives at once, <laughs> you know, because I'm pretty sure the guy was really admiring the fact that he had three wives at once. But uh, the point is, again, you, you got to understand that average people, especially in really poor countries with low educational levels, you start asking them questions about international affairs, they don't, I mean, this is just so outside their ken. It's just so outside. They'll have strong feelings about the economy, about their leader, you know, is there inflation, things like that. But you start asking them about, you know, what, are you, what should we do about Iran? They don't, what, you know? So, I mean, I, again, you look at the question, try to, try to assess how much you should uh, trust the, the answer. Um, so this is a map of the 37 countries uh, uh, where we surveyed and asked about U.S. favorability. Red is where U.S. favorability went down from the previous year, and blue is where U.S. favorability went up. You might notice there's one big landmass where it went up. Um, this, these are the same numbers by country uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, this is the snapshot. 2017 favorability of the U.S. As you can see, uh, we remain quite popular in places like Poland, 73 percent, Hungary, 63 percent, Italy, 61 percent. Our dear friends, the Germans, don't like us so much anymore. Uh, the Dutch, the Spanish, very negative about the, the U.S. Uh, strong support for the United States in Vietnam, Philippines, uh, South Korea. Not so great in Australia. People are divided uh, about the United States. Um, very strong anti-Americanism in the Middle East, but uh, very strong support for the United States in Israel. In fact, it went up a little bit in Israel uh, after the election. Uh, but the interesting thing about these numbers in Lebanon, Tunisia, Turkey, and Jordan is that um, the image of the United States collapsed under George Bush and it never recovered under Obama. Uh, you may remember I showed you a bit earlier, it did recover in Japan, our image recovered in, in Russia even, it didn't recover in the Middle East. So at least in that case, it raises the question of can you do permanent damage to the image of the United States and you can't recover. Uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, it did recover in, in places when Obama was elected. But going forward, as you think about, okay, can we recover from the damage done by the Trump administration or image, you could interpret it either ways. Well, it bounced back eventually in, the, in Europe, or you could say, no, it never bounced back in, in the Middle East. So um, uh, that's one of the potential costs. Um, 
we remain very popular in African countries we've surveyed and for the, and less so in, in, in Latin America, especially not in Mexico. I'm not 100% certain. I think it's the lowest uh, favorability of the U.S. we've ever found in Mexico. And I know Gallup in their survey they just released, it was the worst number they've ever seen uh, in Mexico uh, for the United States. But probably understandable given uh, uh, the, the debate going on in the United States. Uh, this is, just to give it, you know, a different flavor of this, this is the decline in one year of the image of the United States. 28 percentage point drop in Spain, 26 percentage point drop in the Netherlands. Those are big drops. Uh, notice there was a 26 point improvement in Russia. Now only 41 percent of Russians have a favorable view of the United States, but it's up 26 percentage points, which is a pretty big jump. Uh, young Europeans are more favorably disposed towards the U.S. than older uh, Europeans uh, by fairly statistically significant margins. 24 percentage points in France, 21 percentage points in Hungary. This is something we've found over the years again and again. Young people, people your age, all over the world, tend to have a better view of the world than people my age. Uh, and no matter what question you ask people, how do you feel about the United States? How do you feel about China? How do you feel about trade? You all are more and more open to the world than my generation. The question we don't have an answer to is why. Is it because that you were born into a world and came of age and formed your worldview when uh, the world was just open. You know, the, nobody talked about red China anymore. China was a member of the WTO and was, you know, part of the global economy. The Soviet Union was gone. Uh, the Cold War was over. Um, uh, globalization was a fact of life. Uh, is that why your, your generation all over the world is more open to the world and you have this technology that allows you to communicate? Or is it just that you're romantic and naive? and that over time you will become more jaded and more critical <laughs> and more cynical about the world. We just don't know. But I think one of the, to my mind, one of the fascinating research questions as this research goes forward is we'll be able to trace whether your generation's views of the world change over time as you age. You know, the, the young uh, men and women I work with at, at the Pew Research Center who are not much older than you will tell me, oh yeah, it, it's not going to change. We're, you know, we're open to the world. We're open to the, all the flux of the world, and all, this is this is who we are. I say, okay, fine. But you don't have two kids. You don't have a mortgage. You haven't lost three jobs. You're not worried about your retirement yet. Come back to me when you're 45 and tell me if you're still as open to the world. We just don't know. But I think it's a fascinating thing. I, it's entirely possible that the worldview you guys have developed will carry with you for the rest of your life. And I personally think that would be a good thing. Uh, I know that the worldview I developed, which was in the 60s, is a part of who I am, even in unconscious ways that I don't even, I'm not fully aware of. So uh, I do think that you probably are developing a worldview, that much of which you'll carry with you, but some of it's probably going to change. And that's going to be the interesting kind of public opinion research question, I think, we got going forward. Um, confidence in the U.S. president has plummeted. Look at the change in a number of countries between the confidence in Barack Obama in his last year and confidence in Donald Trump. An 83 percentage point drop in Sweden in one year a 75 percentage point drop in Germany in one year. I can't say it's unprecedented, but I can tell you I've never seen movement like this in one year. <laughs> it's it, it's jaw-dropping. Uh, and it's not just, you know, in, in parts of Europe. I mean, in Senegal, it's down 51 percentage points. In Australia, it's down 55 percentage points. So uh, that's a huge change in any public opinion in one year, whatever the issue might be. Um, this is if you graph the confidence in the U.S. president in Europe over time. 
Notice that it kind of declined under Bush over, the, over time, jumped up, up under Obama, and it bounced a lot around, kind of went down a little bit, kind of recovered a little bit in the last year, and then just dropped dramatically. I showed this um, uh, graph to a very senior official in the German Chancellery in Berlin, and he had an insight that I, I failed to have. He looked at it and he said, oh, that's really interesting. It took Bush eight years to get to this low point. It took Trump two months. <laughs> Now, I think what this shows is the volatility of these things, right? But it also shows how deep the hole is to dig yourself out of. Um, uh, now, you could argue that <laughs> it can't get much lower than that, so it can only go up, we, we, but we, we don't know. I mean, we'll see over time, right? OK, uh, what are some of the implications of this? Um, we're able to, because we ask people about their political leanings, uh, when we do these surveys, we ask people who had a favorable view of various political parties in Europe, and then we could correlate their favor, you know, their political leanings with their responses to other questions. As I guess one might have expected, people who have a favorable view of the right-wing populist parties in Europe have a more favorable view of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, people in France who have a favorable view of the National Front are 33 percentage points more likely to uh, have a favorable view of, of, of uh, Donald Trump than, say, uh, people who, who, everybody else in the society. Uh, and you see the same with UKIP. You see the same with uh, the Swedish Democrats that are very anti-immigrant. Uh, the AFD in Germany, you see the same thing. So one of, on one hand, you could say, well, yeah, this is what I expected. But on the other hand, it's interesting. It helps you confirm your data, you know, because you say, well, this, this hangs together. And, and, that's, and again, one of the other things you're working with data, you know, does the data hang together? You know, or you have all these outlier results and you can't, this doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, we ask people uh, in our survey about various policies that are associated with the United States or with the US president. And every four years, we tend to ask about personality characteristics of this new person who is the US president. Because we, we again, we understand that foreigners might not have a very detailed understanding of US policy, but they might have an emotional impression of this person who, is, who has become arguably the leader of the world. Uh, we asked people last year uh, questions about signature uh, Trump policies. Uh, and by signature, these were things that he had repeatedly said during the campaign that he wanted to accomplish and he talked about initially uh, after being uh, uh, inaugurated. Uh, and as you can see, the red is basically that this is the median of 37 countries around the world. Basically, 76% of the public around the world said, we think building a wall is a bad idea. We disapprove of that. Uh, withdrawal of support from major trade agreements, again, very uh, uh, opposed to that. Similarly opposed to the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. Notice that only 49% disapproved of, of uh, uh, getting out of the Iran agreement, which I thought was fascinating, actually. But what you should also notice, and this is something, again, when you're working with data, notice here that 90% of the public uh, had an opinion about the U.S. withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord. Only, what is that, 83% had an opinion about uh, the Iran deal. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to notice how big are the don't knows. Uh, it suggests the public doesn't know much about that. And you will find on a lot of these international issues, say in India, which I know a lot about because I do a lot of our work in India, you can get 50% don't knows. And um, uh, so you have to take the results with a grain of salt because often the don't knows outnumber the pros or the cons. <laughs> and again, as an aside in terms of working with public opinion data, if don't know is not an option, be very wary of the results because 
public opinion survey, there are good public opinion survey firms now in almost every country in the world because global capitalism requires that. I mean, you know, Toyota wants to know whether Tanzanians want to buy Toyotas. You know, so there's got to be somebody whose data they can trust because they're going to make an investment in Tanzania. Uh, the problem with commercial survey work is that uh, commercial survey people, their clients, say it's Coca-Cola, don't know it's not an answer they want to hear. They want to know, do you want to drink Pepsi or Coke? If you had to choose, would you drink Pepsi or Coke? Don't tell me don't know if you had to choose because Coke or Pepsi are going to make a big investment in this country. We want to know what, what people would do. In the kind of public opinion work that I, certainly I do and that I'm interested in and probably maybe you're interested in, which is more policy-oriented work, don't know is a totally legitimate answer. It tells you the person hasn't thought about it. And, you do, and if you have very low don't knows, and I've seen data come back from some countries where it's like zero don't knows. It's like, this is just not plausible. They, you know, they, they, they press the person for an answer. <laughs> you don't want to press the person. If he says, I don't, I don't, Paris, climate, I, what, I don't know what you're talking about. Fine, that's, that's cool. That's, that's, that's great. So again, it's one of the things to look at when you're working with public opinion data. Um, this just shows you the European opposition to us pulling out of the Paris Accord, overwhelming, obviously. Uh, this is the op European opposition to um, uh, U.S. getting out of trade deals, again, overwhelming. This is Japan, where we ask these questions. And you can see, again, overwhelming on almost all of these issues, uh, less so around, around uh, the Iran deal, uh, but overwhelming on most cases. Um, we also ask people about uh, the president's personality. Uh, we give people various options. This is not volunteered. I mean, it, again, if you ever get into survey work, you know, you'll have a bright idea. So why don't we ask an open-ended question? Just tell me what you think. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fascinating, but it's chaos because, you know, you ask a thousand people and, and we, we survey about a thousand people in every country. You ask people an open-ended question, you'll get 800 different answers. <laughs> and then how do you analyze it? So you give people some options and, you know, these are all separate. They can say he's, a person's arrogant, he's intolerant, he's dangerous, he's a strong, you know, they could, they, they could have an opinion about every one of these. Basically, uh, the median around the world is people think the president is arrogant, intolerant, and dangerous. And very few people say he cares about ordinary people. Uh, well, a majority think he's a strong leader, though. It's a fairly positive response. Uh, here's the breakdown in Europe, just to give you some more yeah, detailed nuance there. Um, notice that <clears throat> whereas um, a lot of Europeans see him as a strong leader, so do the Russians. Very few Europeans see him as charismatic. Nobody sees him as qualified except the Russians. <laughs> Nobody thinks he cares about ordinary people except the Russians. <laughs> uh, and overwhelmingly, people say he's arrogant, but not the Russians. <laughs> overwhelmingly, people say he's intolerant, but not the Russians. You get the, you get the point here. Japanese overwhelmingly saw him as arrogant, intolerant, dangerous, charismatic, but charismatic and a strong leader, uh, but not qualified to be president of the United States. Um, what was interesting in the Japanese results, again, and this is one of the interesting things to do when you analyze survey work, see if you can get the demographic responses. It's very hard. We provide it. Most people don't. But it gives you generational stuff, right? So, yes, the Japanese don't have a very good view of Donald Trump. But young people in Japan tend to have a better view of him than older people. I wouldn't have predicted that, but um, for whatever reason, you know, they see him as a strong leader, much more so than older people. They, they don't see him as qualified to be president, but it's almost, they're almost three times as likely to see him as qualified as older people. It's interesting to analyze this stuff uh, by generations when you can. Um, you know, soft power is one of these concepts that we've always prided ourselves. You know, even if they don't like us, you know, we have the soft power, 
People like our ideals, they like our culture, uh, and it's always going to be a good strong suit for America. Well, we've attempted now a number of different times over the last 16 years to ask about American soft power. And what you get is not totally what the theorists suggest. <laughs> we ask people about Americans. People tend all over the world to have a favorable view of Americans. This is consistent during the Bush administration, Obama administration, and now. So 58% have a favorable view of Americans. That's much higher than the favorable view of the United States, right? So they, people around the world tend to like us as a people. Um, and they overwhelmingly like American culture, music, movies. This is our strongest suit in almost every country. And we've asked this question three or four different times in the last 16 years. It is, that's the American soft power that we have that's, that's indisputable. People do think we respect the personal freedoms of our people, but I'll show you in a minute that that may be going down in some places. Uh, we ask about American ideas about democracy. You know, we're this shining city on the hill, and you know, we are the uh, example of democracy all over the world, and we should promote our style of democracy all over the world. Well, actually, people are divided about American democracy in general. Now, it varies by country, and I can tell you there are some places where they still very a strong idea, but other places it's not. And this is the most controversial question. I wrote this question, so I know what I was trying to get at. We were trying to get at how do people feel about what I think is indisputable is the Americanization of their culture. In other words, uh, as I once heard a Vietnamese official say, you know, some kid got up in, at a, some big gathering like this in Paris and said, oh, the Americans are trying to overtake us all and this Americanization of the world is just horrible. And this very wise Vietnamese official said, no, it's not Americanization. It's just that America has gotten to the 21st century first. <laughs> and this is the 21st centuryization of the world. <laughs> and you blame America because they got there first. Well, I, he may or be right or wrong, but I think what we were trying to get at is, I think what is indisputable is, is that a lot of what's happening around the world is about how we, people are becoming like us in ways, and we were trying to test whether, they, how, they, how they feel good about that or not. And, uh, but we realized if you ask people about Americanization, they're gonna say no. <laughs> it's like, no, we don't wanna be Americanized. You know, we're French or whatever. So we ask about American ideas and culture. Now again, this is the lesson in interpreting data. There's a limitation to that question. The respondent hears that, and again, remind you, respondents, you don't know what the respondent is hearing when you ask them the question. You will try to write the question as in the most balanced way possible. You will try to make it the simplest language possible. You will go through with translators. These are all done in form. You know, is there a word in your language for this, for, this, for this word? Nevertheless, you don't know what he or she is hearing. when they. And, and so when you ask people about American ideas and customs, which American ideas and customs, right? Is it baseball? Is it hot dogs? Is it, I don't know what, you know? But, it, but again, so again, you can't overinterpret the results, but I do think that you, you know, you're, what you're trying to get at is how people feel about this change that's going on that they may think is being imposed upon them by the United States, and people aren't very happy about it, uh, is, the, is the upshot. This is just the question of, uh, does America preserve, uh, protect the freedoms of its own people? Notice that for years, the Europeans said, yeah, of course it does. And then you had Snowden. And then you had um, the Black Lives Movement. And then it dropped down to here. Now, it's still, a, you know, about half of the European public says America does protect the personal freedoms of its own people. But it now seems to be stuck down here. So again, the question of, you know, do these things change and they don't come back? Well, this one hasn't come back yet. We'll see what happens uh, in 2018 or 2019 when we ask this question again. Um, this, to get back to this question about Americanization, Europeans are the ones who are the most 
resistant to the spread of American ideas and customs in their country. Uh, especially the Germans, the Spanish, the Dutch, that's you know, pretty strongly opposed to that. Uh, U.S. ideas about democracy, again, the, the Germans, the Swedes, the French, very critical of American ideas of democracy. Now, this is, again, a perfect example when you do survey research. This has led us to a long internal debate about what, should, what, what do people mean by this? What is it about our democracy they don't like? And, and you know, there's this tension between how much do they know about our democracy, but you don't want to overestimate their knowledge. But on the other hand, you'd love to get behind this num these, these findings. Is it the way we finance our elections? Is it the television ads we allow on TV, which I can tell you, having shown some of these to Europeans, they're appalled. <laughs> We're allowed to put in our television ads. Is it um, uh, the way we conduct our elections, right? I mean, the hanging chad didn't do us a whole lot of good in, in, American, in European public opinion. Is it um, just the results of the election? They don't like the results. Uh, but it is, it, it, this answer cries out for more research in terms of trying to figure out what it is about us that's not attractive to people. Um, final point, um, does any of this matter? And that's, I think, an intellectually honest question we have to ask ourselves. The fact that you are in, at the um, Albright Institute and you, you obviously care about international affairs and I would assume that many of you are like, oh my God, this is horrible. They don't like us anymore. This is really bad for America. This is bad for the world. Yeah, maybe. And I guess, you know, my personal view might be, um, yeah. But you need to prove that, right? You need to kind of test that to see if uh, maybe it doesn't matter that much. I can tell you when we first came out with our data in the Bush administration, and there was this rising anti-Americanism, especially in Europe. Uh, some very res re respected professors did a study, and they looked at the sales of Coca-Cola, the sales of Nike, sales of McDonald's in Europe in the wake of the advent of the Bush administration in the Iraq War. No sign that, it, that rising anti-Americanism had any impact on the sales of these iconic American brands. Their revenues went up, their profits went up in Europe. So what's to worry about? One data point, but an interesting one. It challenges the assumption, oh, this is horrible for America. Um, on the other hand, uh, our data showed that uh, there was an incredible jump in anti-Americanism in Turkey, even before the Iraq invasion. Well, what happened subsequently to that? Uh, the U.S. government asked the Turkish government to allow us to invade Iraq through Turkey. The Turkish parliament said no. It's democracy. Their people told them they didn't like the United States. Was that a causation? We don't know, but, you know, again, might suggest that they were listening to what their voters were telling them. Uh, similarly, we asked the Germans to help us in the Iraq invasion. Now, this is over and above whether you think the Iraq invasion was a good idea or not. That's a separate issue. We asked the Germans to um, uh, help be part of this uh, coalition. Germans refused. Well, there was a lot of anti-Americanism in Germany. Did that in help inform their decision? I don't know. You could ask them. But reasonable to assume that democratically elected German politicians knew that this would be unpopular if they did it. We asked people uh, in our survey in 2017, do you think that uh, relations in the, with the U.S. are going to get uh, better or worse or stay the same. Uh, now, the response that was kind of the more dominant response is to stay about the same. Basically, at the beginning of the Trump administration, people said, well, we don't think it's going to change very much. Uh, we're going to ask this question again this year. Do you think it has changed very much? <laughs> Be interested to compare those results to, to these results. Especially in Europe, people said it's not going to matter. Yeah, only the Germans, the you know, majority of Germans said, no, this is, things are going to get worse. Uh, maybe they were prescient. We're not so sure. Yeah. Uh, notice the Russians said, no, things are going to get better. Um, now, the interesting thing was on this relationship 
between Europe and the United States, there, are, there were ways in which you could test this. The president as a candidate and in his first few months in office was strongly critical of NATO. Now he backed off that eventually, but by the time he backed off, we had already asked these questions. So people in Europe had heard the president of the United States as a candidate and then in his first months in office being very critical of NATO didn't hurt NATO's image at all. Not in the United States, where it went, actually went up <laughs> from 2015 to 2017. Uh, went up in Germany. So was there an impact of this? Can't, can't find it here. We asked people in 2015 and then in 2017, as you may know, in the NATO agreement, if you're a member of NATO, you commit yourself under Article 5 of NATO to go to the defense of another NATO ally if they're attacked by anybody, but Russia is basically what we're talking about. Basically, despite the fact that the president as a candidate certainly had raised doubts about whether the United States was still willing to go to the defense of a NATO ally, Europeans don't, didn't seem to be affected by that. I mean, they're, they're, they assume the U.S. will come to their aid, um, and that hasn't changed very much from before Donald Trump was even a candidate. Uh, so again, does it, this matter? Well, it's not at all clear, at least in the short run. Um, in Japan, people said, we think things are going to get worse, not better, uh, under Trump. Uh, but when we said, do you, think, do you trust the United States will come to your aid if there's a war with North Korea? Do you trust the U.S. will come to your aid if there's a war with China? Overwhelmingly, people still said yes. So again, even though there'd been a decline in confidence in the U.S. president, there was this expectation things were going to get worse. It didn't have a practical impact on their expectation that the alliance would hold, uh, which again, I think is an, an interesting uh, uh, result. So again, we don't know how much the image of the United States and the image of the U.S. president matters. Uh, you will have, all have your own opinion about whether it matters or not. But again, it, it's important, I think, to test that against what we do know before we you know, kind of spin out of control in terms of either how much they love us or how much they hate us. Um, I've talked too long, and you have failed in interrupting me once. <laughs> I cannot have been that clear, <laughs> but let's have a conversation. So, uh, you know, raise some questions, um, make some comments.